Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you guys enjoy our part three on our Psalm 23 series. Make sure you guys share this with a friend and we hope you guys enjoy the service. The story of God's chosen people, the Israelites, fleeing from Egypt is a well-known one. The plagues and the parting of the Red Sea, it's a narrative that's well-worn even among people who don't go to church. But the period of time after God's people left Egypt sees them wandering around the, promise, uh, wandering around the desert, preparing to enter the promised land. They were wandering around for many years. And even though God was continually providing for them, they were world-class whingers. One of these times where they're whinging comes in Numbers 21, uh, immediately after God has rescued them once again. But this time it comes in the hands, comes from the hands of an enemy called King Arad. After fighting a fierce battle that was won only because God was on their side, the Israelites grew, grew impatient once again. They spoke against God and Moses, and they complained about the quality of food and the lack of water. They were asking. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die? So the Lord sent fiery snakes among the people and they bit them so that the many of the Israelites died. Now here in Australia, we have some pretty nasty wildlife that can potentially kill you, but I'm very thankful that we don't have to deal with fiery serpents. My guess is when it says fiery serpents, serpents it just means that when you get bitten, it feels like you're on fire as opposed to, I suppose the other option is to have a snake that's on fire, which would have been 
probably more terrifying. But either way, this was a pretty horrific thing to happen to God's people. So once again, uh, God's family repented and they came out to Moses and said, Moses, we have sinned. Pray to the Lord to save us. The Lord told Moses to make a bronze serpent and set it up on a pole to save the people of Israel. Whenever anyone was bitten by a fiery serpent, all I had to do was look up at the bronze serpent and live. I love this story because I think it explains the gospel in such a simple way. We have been bitten by sin and we are destined to endure painful suffering because of our own rebellion against God. But God in his sovereignty provided a way out for us. He placed his son up on a pole so that all we have to do is look to Jesus on the cross and live. Jesus says in John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus died an excruciating death so that we could be saved. His body was broken so that ours wouldn't have to be. His blood was shed to take away our sin. As we share in communion today, let's remember our Saviour nailed to that pole. His costly sacrifice to save us from our sin and his victory against death when he rose from the dead. Thanking him that all we need to do is look to Jesus and live. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the story from the Old Testament that shows once again how you saved your people from pain and suffering. Thank you how this was fulfilled in the New Testament with Jesus dying on the cross for us. We pray that you would... uh, Yeah, you will bless us as we turn away from sin and as we look to Jesus to be our saviour. In your name we pray. Amen. One Timothy six verses seventeen to nineteen says, "As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good and to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of which is truly life. If you are anything like me, you don't." Uh, feel rich and you might be tempted to, uh, to feel like Luke's instructions don't apply to you. But generally here in Australia, we are really, really wealthy. For those who live on the, uh, on the Australian poverty line, for instance, you are in the top 87% of earners in the whole world. And uh, median income earners in Australia are richer than 96% of the rest of the world. I've got no interest in guilting you to give money to church. But I would like to encourage you to listen to Paul's instructions for the rich in the present age. Don't be haughty or set your hope on money. Be generous and ready to share, storing up heavenly treasure for yourself.
surrounding me, let it break at your name. Still call the sea to steal, the rage in me to steal. darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus you silence fear Jesus, Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus I breathe call these bonds to live I call these lungs to sing again I will praise breathe call these bones to live call these lungs to sing once again I will praise Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus Silence, fear, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, 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 you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, you silence, fear.
darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus Your silence fear Jesus, Jesus You make the darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus We've been sharing each week as we continue this series on the 23rd Psalm, a few different variations on this beautiful Psalm. Well, during the week, I found this one. It's called the Psalm 23 Antithesis. In other words, it's the opposite to what the 23rd Psalm actually says. Have a listen to these words. The clock is my dictator. I shall not rest. It makes me lie down only when exhausted. It leads me into deep depression. It hounds my soul. It leads me in circles of frenzy for activity's sake. Even though I run frantically from task to task, I will never get it all done, for my ideal is with me. Deadlines and my need for approval, they drive me. They demand performance from me beyond the limits of my schedule. They anoint my head with migraines. My in-basket overflows. Surely fatigue and time pressures shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the bonds of frustration forever. Wow, it certainly makes us very grateful, thankful for what the 23rd Psalm actually says. Well, we are looking at the third verse of the 23rd Psalm. We're focusing on this. We're going to dive in deep. And this verse says to us, He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. He restores my soul. Perhaps more than ever, at least for a very, very long time, we need this restoration. Perhaps more than ever, our community, our church, our nation, in fact, the whole world needs the Lord to restore its soul. 
We've all felt the grief and the burden of this coronavirus and all the restrictions and lockdowns and other things that it has brought to our nation and to our region. We've all felt a flatness, a dryness, a heaviness. Life may never be the same for so many people. We all need the Lord to touch us, to bring restoration to our soul. A heavy fat sheep, or one whose wool has got very, very thick, will sometimes lie down and try to get comfortable in a, a little bit of a shallow in the ground. It may roll onto its side and stretch itself out, just trying to find some kind of comfort and rest to relax. But suddenly, the sheep's centre of gravity shifts and it finds itself rolled over onto its back, its feet lifted up in the air and it cannot right itself again. It might start to panic and frantically kick its legs in the air, trying to right itself, but it only gets itself into more and more strife and trouble. The sheep cannot regain its footing. Soon gases begin to build up in the sheep's body and sadly, in that situation, it'll only be a few short hours until that sheep dies. The only hope that that sheep has is for the shepherd to come along and to lift it back onto its feet to bring it rescue, to bring it restoration. God and only God can truly set you right. God can bring you the restoration that you need. Healing, comfort and peace. No matter what you're going through, no matter how serious things may be, whatever the trial is that you are experiencing, the answer can be found in God, in His restoration. Psalm 40 verse 1 and 2, it says, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me and He turned to me and He heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. Perhaps right now you're feeling like you've gone belly up. Maybe you feel the stresses, the anxiety, the burdens are so great that you're just going to fall into a heap. You may feel helpless and hopeless. God and only God can bring restoration to your soul. Listen to these beautiful words of promise from our Lord Jesus Christ. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. This third verse goes on to say this. He guides me in paths of righteousness. He guides me. The Lord guides us. The Lord God wants to be our personal guide. The very first time Kyle and I went to America, we decided to hire a car and plan to drive from Los Angeles to Las Vegas, pretty well a full day's drive. So we went to the car hire place and we put all our bags in the boot of the car. I then got into the car, then promptly got back out of the car because I'd got into the passenger side because the driver's side and passenger side are opposite in America. Got back in the driver's side, started up the car, drove out onto Hollywood Boulevard took a left turn and found ourselves on a six lane freeway with literally thousands of cars all doing close to a hundred miles an hour. It was the most stressful, scary and difficult thing I'd ever done in my life, particularly behind the wheel of a car. I was gripping the steering wheel so hard, so tightly that both my arms went completely numb. But imagine 
if when I hired that car, the car came with a personal guide. Imagine that personal guide sat directly behind my driver's seat. And as we drove out, he gently instructed us along our drive, slow down a little bit here, Andrew. Get ready to take the next left turn, Andrew. Speed up here. You've got a long way to go. Okay, begin to slow down. You need to take the very next exit and so on and so on. How much easier that drive to Las Vegas would have been. How much freer of stress and worry and fear that I would have been. It would have made life much, much better and far more enjoyable, that drive all the way to Las Vegas. When Psalm 32 verse 8, God says this, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. And again, in Isaiah 48 verse 17, God says this, I am the Lord your God who leads you in the way you should go. In John chapter 16 verse 13, Jesus promises us this. When he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. In our life's journey, God wants to be our personal guide. He wants to sit beside us and guide us along the road. He wants to warn us of coming obstacles, help us to avoid potholes, to keep us on track so that we may reach our ultimate final destination. This verse concludes by saying, for his name's sake. For his name's sake. This is the ultimate result of God bringing restoration to our soul and guiding us in paths of righteousness. It is so that he and he alone is glorified through our life. God wants to bless us. God wants to lead us so that our life may bring him glory and honour. Mahatma Gandhi is considered one of the greatest men to have ever lived. He was a Buddhist, but for a while he actually investigated Christianity. He was once asked why he had rejected Christianity in favour of Buddhism. And he made his what is now considered a bit of a famous statement. He said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. That's a fairly challenging, if not damning statement. So how are we living our life? As God restores our soul, as he leads us in paths of righteousness, Are we living our life for his name's sake? Does the way that we live our life bring glory to his name? Is our life reflecting the character of Jesus? Quite often, it seems to happen, I was sitting in my office at work and all of a sudden there'll be some commotion outside, some couple fighting, arguing, And you'll hear someone's voice raise louder and louder. Next thing, there's this barrage of abuse and every swear word known to man being shouted and screamed in anger. And sometimes I'll go out into the 10th Street or out on Deacon Avenue to see what's going on, see if everybody's okay. And I often find myself thinking as I see these people fighting and screaming and yelling out in public, don't they have any shame? Don't they care what other people may think about them? But then I'm very conscious to realise I need to ask myself those questions regarding the way that I'm living my life as a follower of Jesus. I need to consider, is my behaviour reflecting positively or negatively on my Lord? You see, when I gossip, it reflects on Jesus. 
If we lie and cheat, it reflects on Jesus. If we bear grudges and refuse to forgive, it reflects on Jesus. If we're proud and arrogant, it reflects on Jesus. If we fail to show love, grace and mercy, it reflects on Jesus. Jesus said, let your light shine before men so they may see your good deeds. Your good deeds. So they may praise your Father in heaven. May our life truly be a reflection of Christ for his name's sake so that through us he is honoured and glorified. As I conclude this message right now, I'm going to conclude by leading us in a prayer. And I want to pray for each of these specific areas that we've seen covered through this third verse of the 23rd Psalm. A prayer for healing, that our soul may be restored. A prayer for guidance, that we may be led in those paths of righteousness. And a prayer of commitment, that we all may be living a life that truly reflects and brings honour and glory to God for his name's sake. So let's pray together. Lord, we proclaim right now that you are our healer. And I pray for healing and victory in the name of Jesus. Lord, this coronavirus pandemic is paying a huge cost on many people. Stress, fear, anxiety, depression, these things are all on the rise. So I pray, Lord, that you will bring a miracle touch to all who are affected. Bring your peace, your joy, your strength, and your blessing. Lord, we are lost without you. And I pray that as we reach out to you in faith, that you would take our hand and guide us along paths of righteousness, that you will guide us along the path of blessing, that you will guide us according to your wisdom and your love. And Father God, continue to shape and mould our life and indeed make us more and more like Jesus. Lord, may we be a reflection of Jesus in love, in grace, in word and in deed. We pray these things for your name's sake. Amen. Well, thank you for joining our service. We hope you guys enjoyed. And make sure to tune in next week for part four of our sermon series. And we hope that you have such a blessed week.